There we go. All right, good evening. I'm Reverend Steve Clay. I'm the interim pastor at Second Baptist Church, and this is our midweek Bible study. And so we'll be getting into Isaiah. We're in the book of Isaiah, and we're getting on over in a little ways. Um, so we'll be talking about that tonight, continuing that. But before we get started, a um, few announcements, and then we'll do our prayer request. Um, like I say, we're, we are back outside for those that are tuning in that didn't know that we are doing our services in the parking lot again uh, as this rise of the Delta variant. Um, so like I say, at 9 o'clock in the parking lot, turn your radios to 87.9. Um, and then like I say, we're going to continue to try to get the sermon part post out on the internet. Um, so we'll be doing that and then also doing the car, doing our um, Bible studies out on the internet. Um, in this format so we'll be doing that and then also if you get out of your car um, please make sure that um, you're wearing a mask because like I say we're out here for a reason that is keep everybody safe and we do have those that are compromised then also like say um, with the changes um, back outside what we're doing now if you need to use the restroom anytime during that service go over to the fellowship hall the fellowship hall is open for the restrooms um, then also, um, we're continuing to collect for the shoe boxes. We're coming down towards the end of the year. Um, we're in, you know, we're halfway through September, October will be here. And as you know, we'll have the shoe boxes going out, um, finishing those up the end of October into the first of November. So we'll have to get that done. So continue to bring those items in. We're not really listing anything specific. <laughs> just um items of whatever you have available so like i say bring those in remember no liquids no candy and no military insignia of any kind um so with that also um we have kay davis i'm um, having her birthday um this week and then also nathan barker having his birthday so remember those um this week we have no anniversaries um on our prayer list <coughs> Joe Marion Edwards, Ronnie Locklear, John, Donna and Jordan Floyd, Louise McLean, Mike and Teresa Ivey, Shirlane Hammonds, Danielle Smith, Elizabeth Norton, Peggy DeLuca, Kenny Jackson, Pearl Jackson, Angie Baxley, Gina White, Carol Powers, Tom Marie Taylor, Jada Clayton, Ashley Baxley, Kim Hewitt, Richard Holbrook, J.J. Johnson, um, Karen Clay. Karen goes back to the doctor on Friday. Um, David Warren, Matthew Ward, Kathy Beanie, Michael Davis, Beth Ward, Mac McMorrow. Mac was under the weather Sunday. Hopefully he's recovered. Um, haven't heard any updates on that, but he was suffering from a stomach bug, so hopefully they've not passed that around the house. Um, Peggy Kane, Joe Pate, Van Garganis, Diane Townsend, Eugene and Florian Eford, Shanna Britt, Chloe Akers, um, Junior House, Tamara Overby, Billy McKenzie, Dan Beard, um, Amanda Kane, Lyndon Cornelius Hunt, the Frisch family, Daryl Britt, Tommy um, Edwards, as you've seen Tommy Sunday, like I say, he is getting around a little better, but he's got a long way to go to heal. Um, like I say, he's healing from a second surgery in a very short period of time. So keep him in your prayer. Um, George Telefaga, Nash White, Judy Clark, Lisa Ray Rodriguez, Bobby Pate, Grant Bowes, um, Patsy Butler, Wanda Carter, um, the family of Robert um, Taylor, remember him. The pulpit committee, our church, the lost, our nation, its leaders, um, the troops and their families, and then the police officers, and then the pastors and their families. And a special request for the pastors um, that are doing a lot of funeral services. Um, like I say, um, a lot of those are really suffering through a lot of fatigue um, with so many, mostly gravesides and outside services in the latter part. Uh, you know the afternoon and all is being hot and so be with those pastors um, then also we added Mary Hall um, had some issues with her niece so, um, taking care of that um, the family of Jeff Stort um, we had little Cooper Frisch um, on there with fever he's recovered so that's a praise report um, Tony Chasen um, bad infection so remember him um, AJ's niece stage 4 cancer Megan um, they say Remember her, several signs up in the area, at least out of my area. Um, remember her, prayers for her. And then um, also the family of Dale, Dale Wilkerson, um, she passed this week also to COVID. So several different things going on. Um, I know there's personal and private requests, some other um, going around that I have written down. Um, so like I say, just a lot going on. 
And like I say, remember the country, we, we did get some rain today, um, which is good. This area is needing some rain. Um, still a lot of gun violence. Um, pray for the violence to end. Um, we're seeing that. Um, the politics in Washington, like I say, we need to, our leaders to work together and not be working for themselves. Actually, I'll show up in our Bible study a little bit this evening. Um, then also, like I say, be praying for our leaders. Our Christians were to pray for our leaders, so we lift up our leaders. Um, we pray that they'll find Jesus Christ, but also that God can use them can, and all and all work. <clears throat> Do according to his will. Excuse me. Um, so like I say, different things going on. Fires, they are getting some rain out west. Um, so like I say, that's good. Um, flooding, still a lot of recovery from the flooding. Um, all the way from the Gulf Coast up to New England. Um, that just doesn't happen overnight, that recovery. A lot of homes have to be rebuilt, re redone, new foundations. A lot of just issues there. So be in prayer for those as well. Um, world, you know, world issues. We've got different things going on um, around the world. Um, over in the Far East with China and North Korea. All the different politics that's going on over there. So need to be in prayer for that. So with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just praise you and give you the glory. And Father, we just thank you for your many blessings. And so many times it's so easy just to keep asking and asking and asking and forgetting the thanks. And Father, you've answered so many prayers. We've had some wonderful recoveries from surgeries and healings that are taking place. Um, Father, we just appreciate that. And the answered prayer for those that are getting stronger and better and Father, you've taken care of so many, and so often it's quick to keep adding to the list of needs, but Father, we need to also thank you, and Father, we just praise you for your hand in working in all these situations. And Lord, we just pray that you'll be with those. Father, we've had several that it's on our prayer list that have lost loved ones, Lord. And Father, many are, several are due to the virus, and many across the county are due to the virus, and Father, we just pray that this virus will come to an end. And Father, if, it, if it's going to continue, then we pray that people will wise up and get the vaccinations and do what's right. And Father, we just pray that you'll bless them and protect each and every one of us from it, Lord. And Father, we also lift up those on our prayer list, Lord. Several have appointments coming up. And Father, we just pray that you'll just bless them. And Lord, and you have already know the outcome, the appointments, the, the things that are going to happen. And Father, just bring them through that and carry them and comfort them, Lord. Father, we've had others that are under the weather. We've seen, heard of one already recovering. I pray that others have already also recovered, Lord. And Father, just strengthen their bodies and continue to allow them to grow stronger. And Father, we also pray for those who are shut in. Father, we have several members that are shut in or can't get out like they used to or it's not safe for them because of the virus and Father we just pray Jesus bless them let them know that you're with them Lord and that may they be comforted and Father we also pray for our nation Father there's just so much going on there's forest fires in the west and there's been some rain and that's good and we got issues at the border and flooding from the Gulf to the New England and Father, and then we have all the different bickering and bite, fighting across the, you know, in our capital. Father, we also, you know, got a lot of gun violence. And Father, in our schools even, we're seeing children bring guns to school to thinking that's going to solve a problem. And Father, in our communities, in our county here, we've had several people shot recently, and they continue. Already we're hearing in this area, you know, gun violence is up, so I think, 30% this year over last. And Father, we just want it to end. And Father, use us. You know, may we be good examples. May we show love. May we show compassion. Father, I pray that it's contagious. And Father, we pray for the church. And Father, as we work our way through and how to deal with this virus and how to continue to minister and all guide us and direct us, Lord. And Father, we are reaching some, and we've heard word from some that, you know, they appreciate that we're doing this type of service, and and all. Father, it's great to hear those type of things, and they feel safer in this atmosphere, and if we can offer them that, then we, we're just thankful for it. And Father, if there's others that need to hear your word, that don't feel safe going to churches, and bring them to us, Lord. 
or show them to us, and may we invite them. And Father, we pray for the church. We pray that it will be stronger, that will, Father, be about your business and not about our own. Show us thy will and teach us all things. And Father, bless us. Bible study this evening as we study it, Lord. Let us learn from it. May your Holy Spirit speak to us. Although we're speaking of prophecies and different things, but also let us learn. So many times we, we think of this as history and prophecy, and we don't take much from it. But, Father, it's there for a reason. You gave it there to teach us. And, Father, be with our military, wherever they're serving, abroad or home, and protect and keep them, Lord. And, Father, be with our first responders, our police officers, firefighters, you know, all those that are, you know, rush in when others run away. And, Father, we just pray for their safety and for their care. And, Father, we just ask you to just guide us and direct us in all things. Lead us, Lord. And, Father, just may we be closer to you. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. All right. If you will turn your Bibles, um, if you want to follow along, we're going to be in chapter 21 of Isaiah. Um, like I say, last time we left off with Egypt, and this evening we're picking up with Edom. Um, and that's what I'm going to pick up in verses um, 11 and 12. Let me get a drink here. Change of weather, change of sinuses, I think, what comes along with it. Um... So, like I say, and Isaiah is speaking, we're going to see a lot of this really at the near time. Occasionally get a little glimpse of a little bit further out, but basically in the near future for these, which for us, really it's going to seem like history. Um, and so, like I said, we're going to be talking about um, Edom first. Verses 11 and 12, it says, In the burden of Duma, he called to me unto Sierra, Watchman, what of the night? Watchman, what of the night? The watchman said, The morning cometh, and also the night. If ye will inquire, inquire ye. Return, come. Now, Edom is also known as Duma or Seir, and that's referenced over in um, Seir's reference over in Numbers 24 18. If you want to go back, so this is a reference. Um, Isaiah moved one letter in a Hebrew word from Adam to Dum, um, or Doom, and it means still or silence. It was his way of saying that Edom will be silent, it will be no more. The Edomites were the descendants of Esau, whose nickname was, who, um, whose nickname was Red or Edom, um, that's over in Genesis um, 25, if you want to go back and read through those verses, 21 through 34. And Edom was also a red land. Um, the land itself was red sandstone, and the people were bitterly hostile towards the Jews. It, there was no love, excuse me, no love lost between them. And so in this prophecy, Isaiah is the person of the watchman. He's the, the role of the watchman, right? He's the one that's on the wall watching. And he is asked, what of the night? You know, what what time of night was it? And the advance of the Assyrian army had brought fear of the darkness for the nation. And Edom wanted to know, is there any hope in the light? That's really what they're asking here. You got to kind of understand what we're talking about because the Assyrian army is on the march. And God is talking about Assyrian and how they're going to walk across this area. And so, you know, they, they want to know, is there any hope? Is there any light at the end of the tunnel? And it, it, the prophet's reply is really brief, but adequate. It, it gives both imitation and information at the same time. And what he's saying is the morning's coming, which is, you know, okay, because Assyria would be defeated by God in the fields of Judah. So you're like, okay, hey, this is a good thing. But the morning would not last, for Babylon would take a serious place and bring further darkness to the nation. So one of the things you got to understand as we're going through these prophecies, we have Assyria that's on the rise. And behind them, right behind them, is the Babylonians. And as you follow through this. And so what? You know, so Assyria has its role, God uses them for a role. Then right behind them, God's going to rise up Babylon and the Babylonians are going to have it. And so Isaiah, he added also after the information, yeah, okay, Assyrians are going to be defeated in the fields of Judah, but, you know, behind them see Babylonians, which are not going to be defeated. 
And Isaiah added an invitation consisting of three words, inquire, return, and come. Seek the Lord. If you want hope, if you want light, then you have to seek the Lord. If you're not seeking the Lord, then you're embracing the darkness. If you're not turning, and that's what he's saying, turn from sin and return to him. Turn back from sin. See, we do this in our own life. We, we want hope, but we want to keep going on and doing the same things over and over that we do every day. We get into a rut or we get into this habit of sin and we keep doing the sins over and over and over. And we're like, hey, we want some God to take care of us. But what we're doing is constantly in this sin rebelling against God. And all, we have to turn away from our sin. We have to change. And then it says, you know, you have, you know, you have to come to him. You got to seek him out and you got to, you know, come to Jesus. You got to come to God. Think about it. If there's somebody you care for, but you never go and see them, how are they to know you're caring for them? If you never seek them out, if you never talk to them, if you never, you know, you say, oh, I like that person, or I love that person, but you never go and talk to them, you never seek them out, you never go visit them, how are they ever going to know? A lot of times we are like that with God. Oh, we say, oh, we love God, but we don't seek his face. We don't do his will. We we don't go to him. We don't, you know. And the problem of it is in that, you know, what we're doing is lying. And uh, I think about, you know, back you know, when you're in high school. And it, it, for me, it's getting further and further away. So, you know, more of a fog, right? But when you had that first girlfriend or the whatever, you couldn't stand but to spend every moment with her. Boy, if you could figure out a way to, you know, you would run around down the hallway just so you could walk her to her next class or whatever. You wanted her to know that you wanted her attention. You wanted to give her attention because you loved her. We need to be that about that, you know, enthusiastic about God. You know, not a flash in the pan, but every day enthusiastic about God. Wake up in the morning and rush to him. Hold on to him. Spend as much time with you as you can. And says if we'll do this, he says he will receive us. When we turn from our sins and we seek out God and we come to him, he will receive us. And so in this prophecy, Isaiah is saying there's a free day of salvation that the dawn would bring. And Edom will you know, needed to heed the invitation, but they didn't. So even though they evaded the Assyrians, what happened? They fell to the Babylonians. And after the Babylonians came the Persians, who changed their name to Edom, Edomia, Edu-ia. And finally by the Romans. And uh, so the battle between Esau and Jacob was carried on by the Herods is really figurative what they're saying here. And all because later the Romans would do what? They would march on Jerusalem. And in 70 AD, Jerusalem would fall. And then basically Edom vanishes from the scene completely. We don't see much of them anymore. They basically vanished. The next set of verses, 13 through 17 in chapter 21, talks about Arabia. And it says in verse 13, The burden upon Arabia, in the forest in Arabia, shall ye lodge, O ye traveling companies of Didium. The inhabitants of the land of Tima brought water to him that was thirsty. They prevented with their bread that he, him that he fled. For they fled from the swords, from the drawn sword, and from the bent bow, and from the grievousness of war. For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Within a year, now, this is a very short prophecy. This thing about he's going to speak the words, and within a year these things are going to happen. According to the years of a hireling and the glory of al Qadar, the glory of Qadar shall fall. So Qadar is going to fall within a year of this. And the residue of the number of archers and the mighty men of the children of Qadar shall be diminished, for the Lord God of Israel has spoken it. Now, what we're seeing here in the imagery is, is we see the prophet saw the caravans of the Arabian merchants from day down leaving the trade route and hiding in the thickets because of the evasion of the Syrian army. Who's going to wipe them out? Here comes Assyria again. 
Oh, they're so powerful, but now that this army of the Assyrians come, these Arabians aren't so powerful. And so they're going to hide. And so food and water were brought to the fugitives by the people from Tema, an oasis town. So you have an oasis, you know, remember the Arabians that were, tend to be wanderers and all, nomads. And so for this oasis town of Tema, brought you know the fugitives of the people in all the food and the water but the people had to flee and um because like I say the thing of it is in trying to flee what do merchants have they have pack animals they don't have you know fast horses they have pack animals they have camels and, and all these animals that are very slow donkeys and all they're not speed animals and all and so what's going to happen the Assyrian cavalry or their bows with the invade weapon, they're going to overcome them. They're not going to be able to run away from them at all. And it and the Assyrians are sort of like God just giving them a contract. You'll wipe these people out, and within a year they will. The Assyrians come and they wipe them out. So the pomp and the glory of the Arabian tribes is gone. Another group is gone. Now we come over into the next section which is in chapter 22 Jerusalem and Judah now the people of Judah were behaving like their pagan neighbors here we go with Israel remember the book of Judges we went through that and how they would turn to God and then they fall away from God turn here's what Israel is doing the, the Jerusalem they're acting just like everybody around them um, and so Isaiah includes them in the list or God gives Isaiah saying hey they're gonna be under the judgment just like everybody else and so he speaks the word. Why is it because they're going to be judged? Because they're acting like their neighbors. And we're going to get into some more detail in a minute. But think about this also. Why should God treat Christians today any different than the rest of the world? I shouldn't say Christians as a whole. Maybe Christians in groups. And all because there's too many Christians today that are acting like non-Christians. And, you know, when a church is no different than the world around it, then what is it? When churches don't separate themselves, when they don't do the things that they're supposed to be doing, and they're acting like the world around it, what happens? Should it be entitled to special privileges? Should it be entitled to special care just because it calls itself a church? I can remember going back several years and then statistics with divorce and everything was just the same and inside the church as it was outside the church and there were so many different issues they brought up in several of these surveys and the thing was the church was basically hand for hand just like the world around it. In a lot of areas the church a lot of times wouldn't differentiate itself from the world. And so why should we expect God to bless the church when we aren't any different? Rather than being the beacons and the lighthouses in the communities, we want to blend in. And, all. and see, we can talk about the church as a whole and we say, well, yeah, that's everybody. Well, you're the church. So if you're not acting any different than anybody else, then you're, you're guilty. You say, well, I go to church on Sunday, I give to the church. But that's not what I'm talking about. How do you speak? What do you do? What is separating you? See, too many churches are starting to look like social clubs that meet on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. They're more like social things. People go there not to worship God, not to lift God up, not to minister to others, but to be ministered to. They want to go in there, and when they walk out of there, they want to feel good and say, oh, wow, look. And they're missing the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is not to feed and take, take care of those that are within, but for those who are without or outside the church. Obviously, there's things we do with them, but the purpose of the church is to bring people in. But we get inside the church and we close the doors and we don't bring nobody in. We become a social club. 
We as individuals are to be unique. We're supposed to stand out. We are either an ambassador for Jesus or an ambassador for Satan. If you're blending into the crowd, you're an ambassador for Satan. If you're not standing out for Jesus, then you are an ambassador for Satan. And a lot of people don't like hearing that. But if people can't tell you're a Christian by what you say, how you do, what you know, then you are an ambassador for Satan. If you have to tell somebody you're a Christian, you got a problem. And this goes back to us having to separate ourselves, not as isolationists as some churches have the practice of, but through the Christian actions and walk. Scripture says that they should know us by our love. Yet so many Christians act like the world, you can't tell the difference. We don't show love, we don't show care, we don't show compassion. We are happy to live in the world and sin with the world. Too much. So let's get back to Isaiah and the prophecy. So, yes, in this God is going to show mercy. And the fact that they're not going to let Jerusalem fall from the Assyrian army. But he will not deliver them from Babylon. You say, well, how is that mercy? He saves them from one army, but not the other. There's a reason. And all because what he wants to happen is for them to learn. And the Assyrian army, remember, he, he, he'll judge the Assyrian army eventually. We've talked about that. Because they go too far somewhat. But he wants to put them under Babylonian rule. And it's pointed out basically because of two sins. And this is what's causing the decline of Judah. And ultimately will lead into the captivity in Babylon, as Isaiah points out. In the first section of chapter 22, we see the first sin. The unbelief of the people. And this is in verses 1 through 14. The burden of the valley of vision. What aileth thee now? That thou art wholly gone up to the housetops. That thou art full of stirs, a tumultuous city, a joyous city. They slain men are not slain with a sword, nor dead in battle. All thy rulers are fled together, they are bound by the archers. All that are found in thee are bound together, which have fled from far. Therefore I said I, look away from me, I will weep bitterly, labor not to comfort me, because of the spoiling of the daughter of my people. For it is a day of trouble. And of treading down in the perplexity by the Lord God of hosts in the valley of vision. Breaking down the walls and crying to the mountains. And Elam bear the quiver with chariots of men and horsemen and cur uncovered the shield. And it shall come to pass that thou choicest valley shall be full of chariots. And the horsemen shall set themselves in array at the gate. And he discovered the covering of Judah, and thou didst look in that day to the armor of the house of the forest. Ye have seen also the breaches of the city of David, that there are many, and ye gathered together the waters of the lower pool. And ye have numbered the houses of Jerusalem, and the houses have ye broken down to fortify the wall. Ye also made a ditch between two walls for the water of the old pool, but ye have not locked Unto, looked unto the maker thereof, neither had respect unto him that fashioned it long ago. And in that day did the Lord God of hosts call to weeping, and to mourning, and to boldness, and to girding with sackcloth. And behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen, and killing sheep, eating flesh, and drinking wine, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. And it was revealed in my ears by the Lord of hosts, Surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till you die, saith the Lord God of hosts. Okay, a lot of imagery here. Now obviously some of this in the front part is talking about the Assyrian invasion in Hezekiah's day. Um, but the primary reference is that the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem in 586 BC, in Isaiah's day, Jerusalem was a joyous city. As people engaged in all kinds of celebrations, and we've read about those back in chapter 5, we'll read some more over in chapter 32. 
the popular philosophy was, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. Oh, we're being invaded, so let's just party and make the best of it before it all ends. There's a scary thought for you. And so Isaiah's like, nope, I'm not going to participate in this. And withdraws from it. And what he was seeing was the day coming when death and destruction would reign in the city of David. He saw the fall of Jerusalem. The people went up to the housetop, but the prophet went down into one of the three valleys around Jerusalem. There God gave him a vision. The visions and the valleys often go together. And what he saw was people dying, not from battle wounds, but from famine and disease. He saw the nation leaders fleeing in fear as the enemy army approached. And so the people would do everything possible to prepare for a long siege. That's where you get the starving and the famine and the disease, right? It's not from the battle that they go out and meet the army with. It's when they hole up into the city hoping they can outlast the army that's battling against them. And so they're prepared for a long siege, and that's what it's talking about. They're collecting the armor. They're fortifying the walls. They're tearing down houses even to, within the city to build up the walls more. They're servicing the water supply. They're laying up a reservoir of water you know, in, in the pools, and they're making another one between the walls. But all this, Isaiah says, all this preparation, this frantic hustling about and running about, is not going to make a difference. Because he says the defenses of Judah are stripped away. What is the defense of Judah? It's God's hand. See, I don't care what you do to make yourself strong, what you build up, or whatever. If God's hand is not with you, you are going to fail we don't think about that in a lot of ways because we like to put confidence and see that's what it's saying here they have a false confidence they said just as the Lord delivered Jerusalem from Assyria he'll deliver us from Babylon but guess what it ain't happening why is it ain't happening because of their sin and, their, and what it is they've turned away from God you know, they walked away from him. They don't believe anymore. Who are they relying on? They're relying on their walls. They're relying on their reservoirs of water. They're relying on their armor. They're relying on everything, but they're not calling on God. Instead of, instead of the feasting, they should be fasting and weeping and putting on sackcloth, pulling their hair in grief. You know, going back into other books where it talks about these type of things and God had sent the nation many prophets to warn them. The Isaiah ain't the only one that came and warned them. And they turned a deaf ear to him. Just as they turned to Isaiah. He's telling them, you guys need to stop. You got to turn back to God. And they wouldn't listen. And now it's reached the point that it's too late. Once God has put this in action, there, he has put it in action, it's not going to stop. Babylon is marching. And they're going to build up these siege walls and they're going to starve the people out. And the reason their sins couldn't be forgiven is because the people had hardened their hearts. See, you sin long enough. You live in the world long enough. You become like the world. And the longer, the more you come like the world, the harder your heart becomes. Jerusalem had lived like the people around them for so long there themselves. The heart was hardened towards God. And God would have to break that heart one day. And the second sin, unfaithfulness of leaderships or leaders, verses 15 through 25. Thus saith the Lord God of hosts. Go, get thee unto the treasure, even unto Shebna, which is over the house, and say, What hast thou here? And whom hast thou here, that thou hast used thee out a sepulchre here? And has he that used himself out a sepulchre on high, and that graveth an habitation for himself in a rock? Behold, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity, and surely cover thee. 
he will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. There shalt thou die, and there the chariots of thy glory shall be the shame of the Lord's house. And I will drive thee from thy station, and from thy state shall he pull thee down. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant El Elikim, the son of Hilkiah. And I will clothe him with thy robe, and strengthen him with thy girdle. And I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulders, so he shall open, and none shall shut. And he shall shut, and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to the, his father's house. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity, from the vessels of cups even to the vessels of flagons. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in a sure place be removed, and be cut down and fall, and a burden that was upon it shall be cut off. For the Lord hath spoken it. Okay, a lot of things here too, right? Now, Shebna is not a place, but Shebna is a person. If you're looking, you're following along. And here, Isaiah is calling the leaders to be faithful. And had they been faithful to the Lord and called the people to repentance, there might have been hope. Okay? If the leadership don't see the problem and call the people to respond, then the people are going to be confused or the people are going to do nothing. And that's what is happening. And so Isaiah is shown here in Shebna is the example that God's using of the leadership thinking only of themselves. Now I can't resist this. we got a few minutes and I'll think about what's going on in politics. And we, we think about Washington. It's, it happens at all levels of government. And it's getting worse. And we've talked about earlier that God will take away good leaders from companies that, from countries who are falling. And all. And here he uses Shebna. And look at what Shebna is. And all. He's thinking of himself. What is happening today? And it's not funny, but it's just so. You could take this and put this right in here to the United States. The elected for officials are so worried about the next election, they're not thinking about what needs to be done. They're worried about securing their position for time after time. And maybe this is why, you know, I'm one of these that believes in term limits. They can't secure it for so long, so they got to work eventually. And, you know, they need to be dealing with issues in a proper manner, following God's wisdom. But what they're basing decisions on is the popular vote or the polls. Oh, man, there's so many polls that are taken, right? You got, I'm, I'm, you know, this TV station and that they take polls and people say this on that issue and whatnot. And, they, and these politicians hire groups to go out and take polls on the different votes that are coming up that they got to vote on and all because they want to make sure they vote according to the voters, especially in their districts. And too many of them are making decisions on popular opinion and not on facts and what needs to be done. Call it standards, call it, call it wisdom, whatever. Now here we have Shebna. He's a treasurer. He is second to King Hezekiah in authority. So he's a man of high power. Calling him vice president, maybe you want to compare him to. And what he's done, he's used his authority authority, and probably the king's money to build himself a monumental tomb and to acquire chariots. Shebna was not a spiritual man. And he probably thought, well, if I can go down to Egypt and get their charioteers and all, you know, I'll be protected and you know, I'll serve my purpose, you know, we'll, we'll do things that way. 
But in this prophecy, and it does happen, God judges Shebna individually as part of leadership. And demotes him. He becomes secretary. And it is disgracing to him. Remember, he has rose from second to authority to being a servant to somebody, basically as a secretary or working for somebody. And he gets deported. And it says he's thrown like a ball into a far country that doesn't give us the country. And there he dies. Had he been in Jerusalem and all, he would have had his monumental, right? His sepulcher had been there. His, he would have had this fancy funeral when his death. And all the chariots and all this stuff. But because he acted the way he did, and was so sinful, and was not leading the people to God, God punished him very directly. Excuse me. So what does he do? He chooses a new man and he raises up Elakim, which says, which means God will raise up. And he called him my servant. Instead of exploiting people, which is what Shebna did in order to get his wealth and to do the things that he did. Elakim would be more like a father figure to him. He'd be a nice guy to him. He wouldn't be demanding him in a sense of you're going to do this, this, and this because I said so. He he worked with them. And he would use his position for the good of the nation. Boy, if we had politicians that would go to Washington, rather than working on personal agenda or the agenda of those that gave them money to win their elections or whatever, but would go to Washington and work on what is for the good of the nation. What a difference that would make. When a nation pulls together under good leadership, what a difference it will make. Elikim was one of these people that God used to pull the nation together. He describes him as a nail or as a peg it's in the wall. And you can hang things on it, the many burdens. He was substantial. But because of the, where the people were, they weren't repenting of their sins. They weren't turning back to God, even though Elikim was giving them a good example and Everything God eventually would do what? Judah would fall. Babylon comes in. We understand. We see, we see bits and pieces of it in the scripture. And we see you know, the book of Daniel and all the different things. And Elikim, I mean, could do so much, but he couldn't do it all. If the people weren't going to turn and, and their hearts were hardened to God. He can't break those hearts. And God didn't want him to. God said, there's a need to pay the price for what they've done. And so ultimately, Judah would fall. And in this whole area, the whole nation would fall. And one of the commentators, they say, Elikim is a picture of Jesus Christ. The greatest servant of all. For that, let's um, stop for the evening and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. And Father, we praise you and give you the glory. And Father, we just ask that you'll be with us. And Father, let us learn from these things. Father, we need leaders that follow you. We need to rise up the leadership within the church. Each of us can be leaders. Let us not do it for personal glory, but let us do it for your glory, Lord. Whatever it is you, you show us to do and to lead or be followers or however let us do it to the best of our ability to bring you glory lord not for us or the group but for you father may we not have hard hearts if we have hard hearts among us crack them lord that we'll be soft pliable and usable by you lord father forgive us of our sins there's nothing in this world that can save us only jesus Lord, bless us in that. May we reread these scriptures and look at them and read the commentaries and do further study that we'll understand what it is we need to do. 
Father, we just pray for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. Bless us and guide us, Lord, and bring us back together again. And may we learn, and whatever we learn, may we apply to our lives. And what we apply to our lives, may it spread out within our community. And be a fire across this nation as we practice the truth. Your truth, Lord. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless and have a good night.